Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Katie. And unlike many other speakers here today, you should know that I'm an expert in absolutely nothing. Um, but despite this, I've been invited here today to share with you how species records and community activism are changing the future for a place called Warren Farm Nature Reserve. It's a journey I'm very much still on myself from being a complete amateur. And I hope to inspire you today to get involved in your own local green spaces in ways you perhaps might have not thought possible until now. So let's have some context. This is Warren Farm, it's my local green space. It's a 61 acre neutral and acid grassland habitat and it's based in Ealing in South London. It's an urban meadow and it has a long 10 year history, which would be impossible to sum up, right? In the short time that we have here today, and I would need many other people here with me to share their stories to truly do it justice. So the amount of activism that's happened to try and protect this green space. Think Game of Thrones and you're getting close. Essentially, Ealing Council wanted to give Warren Farm to Queen's Park Rangers Football Club for a, a peppercorn rent. And that's just one pound for 200 years. That would have taken what was previously community sports pitches out of the public community access. And the site of importance for nature conservation would have been completely destroyed. It would have gone into the hands of a private company. And this company wanted to cover it in landfill, which they would have made a fair bit of money from doing so. And they wanted to do things like add like 750 car parking spaces, a massive building and artificial glass pitches, just to name a few. For eight years, campaign groups took action against Ealing Council to try and stop them from giving Warren Farm away. And they were unsuccessful. But what they did achieve is they slowed things down. So with all the legal wrangling that was taking place, something in the meantime, really incredible was happening. Warren Farm went back to nature. And it had a chance to be wild and start to show us things we've never seen here before. I was just a dog walker. I enjoyed my local parks and green spaces. I picked up my dog too. And then one day I bumped into QPR and their ecologist on Warren Farm. Now we have skylarks. Skylarks are red listed birds. They've had massive habitat loss and they're facing extinction in the UK. They have an amazing, beautiful flight song and they nest in the ground. The ecologist said to me that day, we're gonna start building works here soon, but don't worry about the skylark nest. We'll leave a five meter radius around each nest we find. I mean, that's not okay, is it? Really, when you think about it. And I've never known Warren Farmer sports pitches. I'd only ever known it as this amazing place for wildlife and walking there. And you know when things niggle you and you can't quite let it go. So I got home and I rang the RSPB and they put me in touch with the Met Wildlife Crime Unit and they came out and did a walk with me. And from then on, the Met Wildlife Crime Unit rang Ealing Council and QPR and said, hey guys, it's really bad publicity for you to be doing this during bird breeding season. Why don't you just hold off for a bit? And while that conversation was taking place, I went online and I looked up this ecologist's report that he'd undertaken for Warren Farm. You can normally find them on council portals. It has to be in public space. And he described Warren Farm as having little to no ecological value and it was species poor. Now I didn't need to be an expert to know that that simply wasn't true. That's when I first came across and heard of Giggle because they were mentioned in this report developers have to consult recording bodies. And I rang Giggle and I said to them, how many records have you got recorded for Warren Farm? And they said, none, zero, there's nothing. It might as well just be like a concrete wasteland, there was nothing. So the Met Wildlife Crime Unit bought us five months. And those five months allowed the Skylarks at least to finish breeding. And a few of us in the local community decided we should officially catalogue what's here. At the very least, it felt like the wildlife deserved to have their existence acknowledged somewhere that mattered. And a lot of people told us we were wasting our time and that it was a done deal. 
And actually we believed them, <laughs> you know, because um, this had been going on for years. But it just felt like the right thing to do. Now, let me tell you, 61 acres is no small task. St. James's Park, as a comparison, is 57 acres. Giggle advised me, they said, hey, if you want to start recording anyway, remember, common species are as important to record as the rarities. I was like, got this. You turn up to Warren Farm, and I'm like, woodpecker, love a woodpecker, done. Um, green, another green woodpecker, great. He's got a red patch on his cheek. It's a male, extra, extra points for that, done. And then this massive oak tree. It's between 140 and 160 years old. We call it the duck oak because of the ducks that once nested in there. Had never been recorded. That tree was here before any of us were born. And hopefully it will still be here when all of us are gone. And yet it hadn't been recorded anywhere, not even on the ancient tree inventory. So that went down. But then of course, I started to photograph as much as everything as I could with the local community. And we were getting thousands, literally thousands of photos of things. We just didn't know what they were. So rather than record them as this is number 1,362, or in the case of this plant, it's the purple plant, but not like that other purple plant. It's the one with the double chin looking thing. <laughs> we decided to do what naturalists before us would have done, and we gave them names. So to me, this will always be Ethel. <laughs> and Ethel became ground ivy, which is a lie because Ethel is not in the ivy family. Ethel is a dead nettle. So just make it extra tricky for us. This was Bert. Bert became Speedwell. And I was quite pleased with that because Bert Speedwell sounds like a pretty cool name. And this was Greta. And Greta became Green Alcanet. Well, I think this name works out really well, which is why I'm sharing it with you, because green alcanet isn't a native species, but is really beneficial for wildlife. And also, why did they call it green alcanet? Why didn't they call it blue? You look at every other plant and they've all got green on them. It was really, it was just like a complete puzzle and it was getting way trickier than it needed to be. So I was like, I really need some help here, clearly. So I reached out and discovered there's a really generous nature community. My lovely friend and neighbor, Peter Edwards, joined me on Warren Farm with a notepad, a pencil, and 40 years Kew Gardens experience and knowledge. I was there with an iPhone, a plant app, ah, yes, technology, and a fries chocolate cream, which I don't recommend taking with you in your pocket on a summer's day. Peter mapped out Warren Farm into 12 different sections in pencil on his pad. And he spent five months looking at every single inch of that land. And he was writing down the plant names that he found in Latin. Then we came across a plant and he was like, hmm, this is a bit of a poor, sad sample, isn't it? I'm not sure what it is. We'll take it to Kew Gardens to check. And I was there like, this is my moment. I've got this, Peter. Behold the mighty plant app. Ooh, back, back. Oh, there's Peter. And uh, I took this photo. Didn't have a clue. Plant app failed. It turned out to be Trifolium striatum. And that day, Peter also discovered Fallopia jumatorum, which is Cox spineweed, which was a first for Middlesex and a nationally rare plant. Mark A. Spencer, the gorgeous forensic botanist and my sort of guru, which is a title he feels he doesn't deserve, he told me about the seed bank and he explained to me that where Warren Farm had indeed once been a farm, all the plant seeds that had been lying there had been dormant. And where it had been left, they were now really starting to rock and show us what was there. And it kind of blew my mind. There were plants facing London and UK extinction on this site. Peter asked me to go off and photograph a clover with him. We went back and it was this big, about the size of rich tea biscuit. And we looked for it and we couldn't find it. And the reason we couldn't find it was because I was stood on it. 
<laughs> we have now recorded over 1,160 different plant species on one farm. It's not bad for species four, eh? And that really started the ball rolling. Sophie Le Guel from France, who runs More Than Weeds, came out to help her. And she introduced me to insects. She thought we have hundreds of insects. We have the bee wolf, it's just a, a beautiful one that we found recently, although a little bit scary. And the yarrow pug moth, pug not being like the dog. And Julian Oliver, who's one of our amateur recorders, made an amazing discovery of the Thanitis striatus, which is a first for Middlesex. It's a trigger warning because it is a spider, but it's missing a leg. So hopefully it's one eighth less scary than it would have been. Yeah. I think it's quite a cute one. As far as spiders go, we found 24 different species of butterflies. And Andrew Wood, the butterfly expert, um, answered my call and came to help. Over 1,000 small heath um, adults in flight, 200 marbled whites, nine to 10 breeding pairs of skylarks, bats that the London bat group, Stephen Ruth Budd came to help us with, slow worms, toads, rabbits, voles and hedgehogs, over 90 different um, species of birds, from barn owls and the barn owl trust, which Lockwood came and gave us a visit, to peregrine falcons, missile thrush, little owls, red kites, you name it, it's here. And when you visit a planet um, like Warren Farm, and it is a planet in its own sort of right, with an expert, you feel like you've swallowed a pill from the matrix and that you're actually seeing things for real for the first time. And just through the simple act of looking, we found so much more than we expected to find. We had a really great team of local communities recorders and the photographers, working with experts. And basically, we inundated Giggle with records. And they told us they'd never had so many species come in for one site in the whole of London than they did for one farm. Could all of this really just be worth one pound? But how did this help us deal with the fact that Ealing Council wanted to give away one farm to QPR for development? And what was considered a done deal? Well, the species records clearly contradicted the QPR ecology report and went on to form the basis of a legal case. Judicial review was granted, which was amazing, on the basis that Ealing Council failed to undertake an environmental impact assessment before they were willing to give the land away for development. We had a really strong and gutsy client on the front of this and a crowd justice page was open to cover the legal costs and everyone was so generous with their contributions. It never made it to court because QPR then pulled out and found a more suitable training ground, which caused Ealing Council to pull out too. The struggles, the sacrifice, the time, the energy, the fundraising, all those failed legal cases, they actually won. Because without all of those activists, we wouldn't be in the position we find ourselves in today. And there's a pattern here. This is Luke Fitzherbert, the gentleman in the tie with the beard. He forms the Brent River and Canal Society, which is a charity that campaigned for the Brent River Park back in 1973, of which Warren Farm is a part. The point being, it's a community, community effort to truly look after our green and blue spaces. Today, I'm a trustee of the Brent River Canal Society. How did that happen? Um, I'm also an organizer for the Warren Farm Nature Reserve campaign. Kabir Kool, the brilliant con conservationist and wildlife writer, had a chat with me and he asked to see the records. And he said to me, you know, there's enough species here for this to be given local nature reserve designation. Hmm. Phil Bellman, the naturalist and also a fellow trustee, took Kabir's idea and blew it into this massive vision. Now I promise you, we didn't just draw the outline of a fish on a map, okay? <laughs> it just sort of was lucky that it turned out that way. And what we're campaigning for now with the Warren Farm Nature Reserve Group is we're asking Union Council to give Warren Farm and all the surrounding Brent River Park Meadows local nature reserve designation to create a nature recovery network so that animals and, and humans actually can all interconnect and have space in which to move. We have a petition of over 10,700 signatures 
which we recently delivered to the Mayor of London asking for his support. Ms. Caroline Pigeon here, um, the GLA member, Alice Roberts from CPRE, myself, and Warren the Bar now with the petition in his beat. We were on BBC London News with our campaign because Warren Farm is part of CPRE London's 10 New Parks campaign. We're currently in talks with the New Ealing Council leader, Peter Mason, who reached out to us in his first week in office. We are hopeful and quietly confident that Warren Farm is going to get local nature as a designation. But until that signed piece of paper is in my hands and I can wave it in front of you, the petition will stay open and we continue to draw on the incredible support we have for this species rich place. I'll keep you posted. Now, I want to say, I get it. When you leave here and you go home today, the chances are you'll put on the news and you'll wonder what the point is of even trying, right? Why record species records when the world is on fire and underwater? When ecology reports like that done on Warren Farm are allowed and that that's just the norm. And not to get too political on it, but when the government declares a climate emergency and yet allows developers and big business to come before biodiversity, we know we simply can't live without. HS2. <laughs> we need to be led by and have decision makers who are what I'm going to call hashtag real deal ecologists and wildlife experts, if we stand a chance of reversing UK being one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. Warren Farm is proof that as a community, every action taken works towards positive change. I love species recording. The closer you look, the more you understand, the greater you care. And equally as amateurs, we can help experts by reporting what we find and don't be afraid to ask questions. I named a plant Ethel, think about it, you can do it. And it's only by working together and learning from the experts that we can pass that knowledge and passion down. And lastly, I'd just like to end with this. It can be really easy to take the green spaces we all love for granted and assume they've always been there and that they're always going to be there and that actually people fought for them, for them to be there for you to enjoy in the first place. If COVID has shown us anything, it's that the world is really small and we're way more connected than we perhaps think. This is a rhinet, it's a woodpecker, and the name really works. Its neck is a rye, okay? This is a goodie. This bird is known as a lifer. You'll be really lucky to see it in your lifetime. It would have flown from Scandinavia to Warren Farm Nature Reserve in Ealing, and then went on to Iberia, and then North Africa. This little guy shows us, you know, that every green space is a contribution to the wider ecological climate challenge that we're facing. If a rhinet sings in a meadow and no one is around to hear it, does it make a sound? Yes, yes it does. So get out there please, check out all your local green spaces and see if they have any records on there or not. And I promise you, you can have a much bigger impact than you perhaps think you can. Thank you very much.